first welcome Professor Maya Jasnov. Uh, Maya is the Coleridge Professor of History at Harvard University and a visiting professor here in the Humanities and Language Division at Ahmedabad University. Some of you may have actually listened to her in conversation to Professor French, uh, where she discussed her very acclaimed work, uh, a biographical work on Joseph Conrad, titled as The Dawn Watch, uh, Joseph Conrad in a Global World. Uh, which uh, won the prestigious Gundil Kandil Pra History Prize in 2018. Uh, some of her other works mm -hmm. also uh, are equally interesting, if not more. Edge of Empire, uh, Lives, Culture and Conquest in the East, 1750 to 1850, which was published in 2005. And uh, Liberty's Exiles, American Loyalists in the Revolutionary World, which was published in 2011. Um, uh, I would like to welcome Maya again. Okay, thank you, Rahul, and uh, it's great to see so many of you on this call. Um, I won't talk for a hugely long time because I think one of the aims of this session is really to give you a sense of the other faculty, the range of faculty here at AU in the history department, and also to offer many chances for uh, us to answer your questions. Um, but I thought that maybe I could start this session by sharing with you a video that I helped to make in my home institution, Harvard in the US, when we as a department were also trying to convey to students some of the value of studying history. So I'm gonna share with you this video. It's about two and a half minutes long. Let me share my screen. And uh, please, if somebody on the other end can message me if there's any sort of problem you have with seeing it or hearing it, uh, let me know. Otherwise, uh, I will assume it's okay. And here we go. more than we knew the preceding week about the totality of the human past. Every week, what we know is increasing. It's absolutely extraordinary. One of the great things about history is everything has a history. It is the most capacious of all the disciplines. Everything that has ever happened is part of the study of history. And I don't think you can say that about any other discipline. It is really a unique department. I think history really provides a foundation for being a citizen in a global world, you know, it may sound hokey, but I think the field of history really came of age with uh, the nation state and it taught people how to belong in a collective society. And I think now that we live in a global society, it's more than ever important for us to know something about where we come from, where we're at, and hopefully it equips us to make better decisions about where we're going in future. So each of us in the history department has a special proclivity to a certain kind of history, whether it's social history or economic history or political history. I see myself as a cultural historian. I'm interested in how people thought about themselves, how they transmitted ideas, communicated with each other in the past. So I'm a passionate believer in biography as a genre. It's a great way into any topic, even if you don't know much about it. And when you do know something about it, it always adds. Because the vantage point of the individual is in many ways the authentic vantage point of historical study. No matter where your interests take you, um, there is a historical angle. We pay a lot of attention to writing. We, some of us may work in the laboratory now, but we still insist that our prose be well-crafted. And so our history concentrators come out with a lot of experience working with professional writers. I find it really fascinating to see students discover their own power to tell new stories about the past. And also the essential tools of critical analysis and critical thinking that will enable you to take on whatever you want to take on in the future. We like to think that uh, the roads leading out of history are infinite in number. And if you look at what our students have been doing in recent decades, I think that the evidence uh, suggests that that's accurate. Okay, so that was a little bit of a historical artifact itself, as you can tell by the fact that I looked much younger, which is a little bit terrifying to me. But, um, but I think that what that video does is touch on a number of the kinds of things that both I and some of my colleagues here will want to talk about with you today. Um, the different kinds of approaches to the study of the past in particular, and the kinds of things that you, if you choose to study history, might be able to add to your skill set um, as you move into whatever sorts of futures you imagine for yourself. One thing I want to start out by pointing out, however, is that there was something in that video that you may have noticed wasn't mentioned at all. And that is anything about 
names and dates. Now, why is this funny? Well, because for the most part, when history is taught in secondary schools, and I think that this is as much the case uh, in, uh, in the US or in Europe as it is in India, it is often taught as a kind of list of names and dates and terms that you're supposed to learn, you know, the names of the kings, the names of the emperors, the names of the big figures, um, and you get tested on your uh, ability to recite uh, lists of terms back and make certain kinds of identifications. There's a definite uh, sort of knowledge acquisition side of history, which has to do with just kind of taking on board these sorts of uh, data points. And yet, I think that in a way, this approach to the study of history really reflects an image problem that the field has. What do I mean by this? Well, history is way more than just a list of names and dates. I think a better way to think about it is really to think about history as a kind of science, if you will. History is no more reducible to the dates you'll see on a timeline or the list of names you might see in a history textbook than, for example, biology is to a list of the names of the parts of a cell or to the kinds of molecules that are in it. To understand history, is to understand a complex system. And that complex system that we study as historians is nothing less than the complex system of the human experience. History is, in, I think, incontestably the biggest data field that is out there. Absolutely everything that happened on any scale constitutes part of the field of study that we have as historians. And so what we learn to do and what we practice doing as historians or students of history is understanding how to process big data, how to take things out from that, and how to create meaning from this data to understand how systems work. There's another part of history that I want to emphasize. I've just said that history could be thought of in some ways as a kind of science. And in fact, in many universities, it's even in the West at least, uh, kind of considered a social science alongside economics in particular as a way of kind of looking at uh, the human experience in a kind of methodical and systematic way. But at the heart of the word history is of course something else. And that is the term story. At the heart of every history, there is a story. Once upon a time, the opening words of uh, sort of the, the traditional kind of bedtime story is after all leading you to the past. And just think about the widespread use of the term story in our experiences as humans here in the 21st century. People are always telling stories about themselves, whether it's to, uh, you know, in the US, for example, to apply to college, you're supposed to write an essay all about yourself. It's telling the story of yourself. You tell stories about yourself to, you know, to, to make friends whenever you meet them. You tell stories about yourself sometimes to apply for a job, to give a kind of narrative of sort of who you are and what your accomplishments are. You tell stories about yourself, if you want to enter into various kinds of public arenas, politics, and so on. Um, hi history as a story is, after all, what, uh, you know, what, what is going on all the time on, for example, social media. What does Instagram have? Instagram has stories, and those stories are part of the narrative that you're creating about yourself, that you're putting out there into the world, chronicling your experience, Facebook, much the same way. And after all, what do we call the news? What is the news called when we you know, refer to items in the news? We refer to them as news stories. So um, story is a ubiquitous feature of the way that we communicate about the world around us. 
And one uh, further uh, element of this I just want to highlight for you is the role of storytelling in business. I'm sure some of you on this call are, are interested in or already studying in commerce or management and might be imagining a career uh, in business. And uh, the ability to tell a story, compelling story about your company, about your idea, about your product, this is a central part of any kind of business career. Now, so much so that there are many, um, you know, many uh, uh, courses and books and so on dedicated to the art of business storytelling. So why am I emphasizing this? Well, story is a central part of history and story is a central part of the human uh, experience, especially now in the 21st century. What that means in turn is that learning how to tell stories to tell good stories, to tell effective stories can be crucial for your future. Learning how to analyze stories, the stories that people are telling to you can help make you a better decision maker. Everyone has a story. And what the study of history helps us do is to figure out which ones are true, which ones are effective and why. And when we're students of history, this is one of the major kind of arenas that we are engaging with. Now, I said just at the outset that I think history has an image problem. People think that it's all just sort of a list of names and dates, when in fact it's about this robust and dynamic and incredibly complex and engaging arena of human experience. There's one other part of the image problem that I think that history has. You could call it a second image problem. That is that people think that history is only about the past. There's a slightly humorous kind of rendition of how people might think about the past. It doesn't really matter. Uh, you know, some stuff happened. There was a period of boom. And now here we are all, you know, swapping videos on TikTok of cats or puppies or whatever it may be. Uh, and, you know, who really needs to know about any of that stuff in the past? People think history is just about the past. And after all, when the pace of change as we're all experiencing it right now in our lives is as fast as it is, it may seem like the past is even less relevant than ever. But I think this is a fundamental misconception about what history is and what the study of history can do for you as a, as a citizen, as a mind, as a student and more. And that is that what history is really about is the study of time, of being in time. And all of us exist in time. It's a dimension of our experience, that of our communities, that of our nations, that of our planet. History is the study of time. And as such, it is as much about the present, indeed even the future, as it is about the past. Every single one of us is a historical actor in the sense that every single one of us moves through time. I like this quote from Ernest Hemingway, today is only one day in all the days that will ever be, but what will happen in all the other days that ever come can depend on what you do today. It could be that something that you see today will stick with you and guide you for you know, the coming week, month, year, and beyond. It might be that somebody that you meet today will become a friend of yours for a long time to come. It might be that something that happens in the world today will end up having ramifications for many of us, uh, either immediately or in the future. And what's more, not only are we all sort of living in history and all of us historical actors, we are also all, whether we know it or not, historians in a manner of speaking. That is because we are all making decisions all the time on the basis of the evidence that we have before us. And we are all, all the time facing or assessing the consequences of our choices as they are made in the element of time. So for me, you know, one of the best things, and this is the last point I'm gonna make, one of the best things about the study of history is that you can come to it from any number of directions and you can take from it any number of contributions. 
This was touched on in the video. So I'd like to just circle back by alluding to some of those ways. You could be quantitative in your study of the past. One of the things that uh, the era of certain forms of computing and data analysis has opened up for us is the ability to do certain sorts of large scale studies about the past on the basis of large data sets. I know of people, for example, who are doing really interesting work where they're uh, scraping uh, information off of things like national censuses, and they're able to take this stuff and then use it to direct uh, much more targeted kinds of research. So you could approach it in a quantitative way. This is, of course, particularly relevant for people who are interested in economic history, um, which is hugely significant for people who are wishing to make uh, predictive kinds of assertions about um, economic change um, and uh, economic patterns going forward. You might, on the other hand, um, approach history through very different kinds of means. You might do it through, say, cultural objects. You can study history through, for instance, the, the, the production and generation of, say, you know, popular culture, movies, television, film, um, uh, books, all sorts of cultural artifacts that you might want to be able to sort of study closely in order to get some insight into the imaginative worlds of people in the past. You might want to look at these sorts of things to help understand why it is that we have the belief structures that we do today. Yet another arena of history um, has to do with uh, the circulation of, of ideas. You might want to look, for example, at how ideas about, for example, democracy or secularism or equality came to have a role in the political systems and structures that govern different parts of the world. And finally, you could look at history as one of the speakers, uh, my former colleague, Professor Neil Ferguson mentioned in that video, you might want to look at history through the realm of uh, significant individuals, biography, which is one of the most popular uh, kinds of books that people read of nonfiction, um, is also a kind of history. So there are all kinds of ways that we can analyze the, the past the present uh, with implications for the future using, uh, using you know, quantitative data, cultural artifacts, uh, and uh, uh, scales on which we can do this as well. So let me just wrap up by saying, in answer to the question, why history? Why should we study history? To answer for you, at least as a starting point for the rest of this afternoon's discussion, to say, that you can't move into the future without getting some sort of grip on the past. And the reason to study history is that it equips you with the ability to assess this fundamental dimension in all of our lives, the dimension of time. Thank you.